Okay, well, welcome everyone. Thank you, thank you very much for being here. And uh, thank you, Lia, Fritz, Edgar, to, um, you know, for having flown out from Jerusalem and joined us tonight. This was um, an idea uh, that came about fairly recently with Dana, who is in charge of the relationships between Bezalel and, um, and the UK. Uh, we have been talking for a while about um, things that we might that we might do together, and this was the first, uh, let's say, concrete idea that we had to to host a, a talk as part of this series of talks that we've been doing here recently to explore the themes of contemporary art from different angles. So, effectively, um, as some of you might know, we. We do a fair bit of uh, education and talking with various institutions. Um, our uh, primary partner in that in that sense is Christie's Education, but we've also done a lot of work with Sotheby's and with Freeze and various other institutions uh, in the UK and abroad. And um, we've recently started bringing some form of of, um, of this in this space to, to address various themes that we think are relevant to, to contemporary art today, but also in general to our audience. Uh, we have had collectors, we have had artists speak here, and today is the first time that we, we do this with, with a university, with an institution, Liat, who's a professor and uh, vice president, so involved in the management of uh, Bezalel Academy and also um, a practicing architect, which is interesting. So today, in fact, we are going to have quite a broad theme, um, which is, however, very relevant today, I think, which is the impact and the importance of art in a broad sense. Um, so the visual arts, but also the applied arts and design and architecture and literature, theater, we could apply this in a, in a very broad sense within society and therefore the education of these, of these disciplines, um, which we, we sometimes take for granted, especially those of us who are used to uh, see exhibitions all the time and participate in talks and, um, and read, but, but it is not at all. And in fact, the Royal Academy, um, who are neighbors and also an institution that we have uh, crossed paths with quite a bit recently, especially because Vanessa Jackson, the artist that you can see on the walls, is a prominent royal academician, and therefore we have, we have, we have held um, some events together and, and so on. They have recently put out an invitation um, of, of, of a talk of their own that is happening this Monday about the fact that you know the, the art education is effectively in jeopardy with uh, it being taken you know, more and more away from the educational system as a, as a compulsory uh, subject and as something that everyone should be required to study. And with university fees going up and with museum tickets going up, uh, public funding being reduced and cost of living crisis and therefore people having to choose what to do. Should I go see sports? Should I go uh, see some culture? You, you're no longer in a position necessarily to do whatever you want to do, but you might be in a position of having to choose. So this is, I think, um, very cogent to, to discuss why it is so important that people continue being able to look at art and being educated uh, on the subject, because art effectively can open our minds um, in, in ways that are very important to society and politics and everything else. So I'm hoping to get you know experience from a senior um, member of the academia in that field and see what what he thinks about it. Thank you. Uh, I think that uh, basically I have questions. I'm, I'm not sure that I have uh, the right answers because I think that uh, it's a crucial question to ask ourselves today. What is the role of uh, art and design? Uh, in uh, in the political situation and in uh, for the society uh, today, and uh, it's not a question that you ask yourself once, give the right answer, and everything is okay. 
but I think that we have constantly to ask it because we are seeing uh, the changes every day. I guess that some of you are following the news from Israel, which is a very uh, trying time in Israel right now. I think that like in other places around the uh, EU and around the world, uh, we see the new government, which is highly uh, populist and anti-liberal and uh, very rapidly tries to change uh, the system. Uh, they call it uh, ju juridical form, but actually by its essence, it's anti-democratic reform. And, uh, and we are struggling right now uh, on the streets and uh, as an academic, we ask ourselves uh, again today, what is the role of arts and uh, design academy in this, uh, in this context, what, what would be our role and who needs art, <laughs> okay? If you are looking uh, about all the challenges that we are facing, who needs uh, art and design? Why should you go and study art and uh, for what? What would be the impact of your decision? Uh, and, and for me, I think, and uh, I can see it uh, especially in the context of uh, Israel and Jerusalem, but. Uh, I can see it uh, with our peers all over the globe that the Art and Design Academy are struggling, I think, for, I for years to defend uh, the rights or the, 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 the right of the people, you know, but uh, also the freedom of speech and the freedom of creation and uh, the idea that uh, everyone should express and expose his own ideas or his own opinion. Uh, and even and maybe mainly when it's not com comfortable for other people. And uh, it's, it's really something that we have to struggle like every day, not just with this government, I think that for many years. And uh, I've been raised based on the idea that art is the place of openness. And I think when we are looking around what is going on in the world, we see that art is more than it is a thing, it's a, a space open space where things can happen. We don't know what would happen. It's, uh, maybe it's a place for something which is not uh, yet right in a way. And uh, maybe it's the beginning of, uh, of answering that, but you can elaborate more about what it means for you here. Definitely, I mean, I, I agree that if there is one place that is um, really um, somewhere where you grapple with new ideas and pushing the boundaries of what a discipline is, that's the realm of visual arts, because mm -hmm. really you don't have boundaries of any kind. Um, if you're working with within other disciplines, you might be limited by uh, whatever it may be, language, structures of various kind, um, uh, instruments. The visual arts has, has really become something that can encompass everything. And uh, this is, of course, a risk, because it can then, the risk is that it disappears into everyday life, which is something that artists in the 1960s and 70s have, have experimented a lot with. <coughs> um, but, but also, it gives it this great power of experimentation, which is effectively boundless, and therefore, should always be the most open uh, environment in which to have uh, any kind of debate. And I, I did, you know, think about this quite a bit in the wake of, um, of us deciding to do this talk together and also having seen what happened you know, in the past couple of years and Bezalel as an institution having put, put out, I mean, the professors from Bezalel having sent out letters to support the Palestinian cause and having had backfires from the government and um, in general uh, what we have seen happening with the Ukraine, Ukrainian people and Russia. I mean, at the end of the day, you always run the risk that art and culture gets caught in the middle of these of this situations, which some people would argue is important that, uh, that a stance is taken, but then the other the other hand, the other risk is that you run into censorship, and then you have to look at this into um, from both sides, and it's and it's always very difficult. But going back to the main and more general point, what I always found is that when you start looking at art, and 
in particular modern and contemporary art, you suddenly feel this sense of anything being possible. And, and this should be, I think, from a very early age, uh, a fundamental part of someone's education. If you are channeled right away into science and scientific subjects, which are certainly very important, but which is a direction that I can see has been taken very much, uh, for example, here in England, and you can, in, in higher education, uh, we have some experts here in the room, uh, but already in, in you know, uh, middle school, high school, uh, choose subjects very narrowly and decide to study for several years, maybe four or five subjects, uh, which then become your A-levels or whatever other form. Uh, and you can decide to focus entirely on physics, biology, um, maths, and you end up missing out entirely. You get to university, and then maybe you even study the uh, um, scientific subject at university, and you end up having missed out entirely on a large portion of humanities and, and other disciplines that are really essential to understanding the world. Uh, and this is, I think, is a very high risk techno, the technocracy that we're living today is also, in a way, a byproduct of that. And, um, and we need to find ways, I think, to, to convey the fact that you will understand science better and you will be able to interpret uh, technology and everything else better if you can look at things from the variety and depth and width of perspective that only art can give you. Art and philosophy and literature, mm -hmm. but you know, this more open and uh, more open-ended discipline. Uh, I believe that uh, every engagement with art, generally, is uh, an act of becoming. And uh, I think that most of our students are not coming uh, to study art and design in order to gain new knowledge and skills, it's part of that. But I think that mainly what they gain is uh, the process of becoming somebody different from what they were before. And, uh, and I think this is the magic of Art and Design Academy. And uh, this is the magic of uh, studying and learning uh, art uh, from the beginning. And maybe we will uh, touch the K-12 system and what is going <coughs> on right now. Uh, and but, but I think that the, the main uh, thing that uh, engaging with art, and, uh, and I think maybe more than with uh, theory and philosophy and all the humanist education, is that you have to, you have to practice your imagination. And uh, this is a super power in the neoliberal regime, I think. Because it gives you uh, different things. First, is uh, that you can imagine, and I think this is a kind of political imagi imagination, you can imagine a uh, different order. And in the neoliberal uh, regime that uh, wh where you, you think that uh, nothing could be changed and this is the reality, uh, you can imagine together uh, different order, different spaces, different uh, kind of living. And I think uh, this is our superpower. And uh, the other thing is that uh, you, you learn how, how to empathize with others, how to, you can imagine yourself in other people's shoes and uh, in a way to live another people's life for five minutes, maybe for some of, uh, uh, arti of the artists, it could be like uh, uh, through all the, your creation. Uh, I think about writers, the way they can empathize with someone else. Uh, and I think this is the basic uh, thing that you come to the world with, with your empathy. And, uh, and I think that uh, both of, of this is, is something that really has uh, uh, an impact uh, on, on the society. And th this is why we need it so much. And I think that if you start with us during uh, the K-12 system, uh, you can really affect society and the way that uh, people uh, develop and the way uh, they, they develop ethically. Uh, and uh, now we, we lose it with all the efficiency and... Uh, yeah, so there are, there are two elements which I think are very, um, in a way, worrying about 
what we're seeing today. So there was a beautiful anecdote um, by an Italian, a famed Italian film director who said, you know, when I was young, we would be put in this large countryside house. Our parents would put us to sleep uh, in a far, when on holiday, in a far away room in a corridor which was dark and there was nothing else around us and the parents would be in another part of the house. And what would end up happening is that when we switch off the light and we stay there in the dark, we would imagine all sorts of things happening around us. Every noise, every cat walking on the roof that we could hear, every branch tapping on the window would generate all sorts of imaginations. Uh, for hours and hours, because imagine this happens every night and it's dark early and you don't have a TV or you don't, you know, that really generated this incredible imaginative power that has brought to us the great evolutions or revolutions that we have seen in, in art and aesthetics in the last 80 years, in the post-war period effectively. Um, and I wonder, whether the fact that today we are being constantly fed with content which is not our own, it's coming from the outside and we can access it constantly. And in fact, we wear it on us. We wear the device on us that enables us to constantly consume this content. If that deprives us from the possibility to actually just stop and exercise our imagination, in the same way that people used to say, well, you know, to read a book or to watch a film of the same story, it's so different because with the book you can imagine. And then with the radio narration, you can imagine a little less, but still you have a big chunk left to imagine. And then with the film, you can imagine less and less because you see. Like a lot of the imagination has been done for you. Mm -hmm. So of course, it gives you great opportunities because all of us nowadays with a camera, with a phone, we can produce, we can immediately take a picture uh, without sophisticated equipment, we can immediately shot, uh, shoot a video. And so it gives you opportunities for expression, but it also takes so much away from you in terms of the ability to just, unless you have a very, very strong willpower to just carve out times for you to do that, which is difficult because increasing efficiency and increasing productivity and all of this is demanded of each of us, so the time for doing that becomes more and more limited, uh, it's really harder and harder. And art is really the only escape. Yeah, it's a very good question. I think, uh, I'm not sure that uh, the way that we, uh, we uh, meet con uh, content today uh, is um, like a good excuse <laughs> not to imagine, in a way. Sure. Uh, I think that maybe it's uh, the new material that we have to exercise, how to work it. I think you could be very creative walking with your phone, for example, uh, in, in all the, the academics today, the, the discussion is about the AI. I don't know if you if you know it, but uh, the way it uh, affects uh, designers' uh, decisions right now, and the way, and I think it should be our new tool. It should be a kind of new material that we should know how to work with. We, we can't be afraid of the technology and the, from the, the content, or uh, especially from the visual context, but you have to educate uh, people how to, uh, use, how to use it, how to be uh, critical about what, uh, what you read or, or what you see, and uh, how to be creative with this new materials and, uh, and, and this, it's maybe it's uh, harder. Okay? Maybe before you can just sit and uh, read something or listen to something and, uh, and now you have to work harder. And, and, and it's really to the question who, who is uh, learning art today when we are looking at K-12 K system and even in the higher education system. Who are the students? that uh, can uh, allow themselves to, to do that. Uh, and uh, and I, I, I myself, I'm a first generation in higher education. Uh, it wasn't easy for me to, to study art. Uh, I wanted to study art and philosophy and uh, literature, 
but I, I, I thought, what would I do with, with that after that? What, what kind of job would I gain with that? So I went to study architecture. Hey, it, it looks like something that you can tell your parents that you are doing something <laughs> that is okay. And actually, until today, we have students that start studying jewelry, but they are telling at home that they are studying architecture. <laughs> we have architecture, so everybody can say that uh, this is like it's, it's close to engineering. You can understand what you are doing. <laughs> uh, and, and I think that this is something that uh, I, I think a lot about. So we are a public institution, like most of the higher education uh, system in Israel. And uh, it's highly important for me uh, to have a diverse uh, body of students and to bring uh, in different uh, kind of students from different uh, kind of system education that they came from before. And uh, I looked on that uh, through the years and I, I understood that uh, it's not just uh, how to uh, make uh, the young uh, 18, 20 student to be engaged with art, but how to make uh, his family or her family to understand that it's something that worth the adventure and uh, it's something that you can gain something out of that and it's important and it's relevant to, to our daily life. Uh, so we understood that we have to start and work uh, during the high school uh, period uh, with uh, uh, neglected communities in Israel. So we have a few programs that we are working with uh, high school students for three years. They are coming to Bezalel once a week and uh, on the far periphery, we open an uh, excellent program, excellent centers for art and design in uh, places where there is n nowhere you can study. Uh, and we bring uh, the families for three years to be with us and to see the different things that you can do. For example, with design and tech today, with uh, how to deal with the big challenges of uh, our uh, society, with uh, the climate crisis, with healthcare, what the connection between design and those big questions? And uh, we see that uh, we are increasing our students uh, from these uh, communities, and it's very important for us. So uh, I think that, uh, in a way, this is our mission. Because I see, uh, for example, my children, they study art from the kindergarten. I paid for that, you know, mm -hmm. like most maybe the people who, who are here today. Uh, but we have to bring it to, to other people and to let everybody to be part of this and to feel comfortable because I think that sometimes when you're arriving in the museum, you, you feel like it's not your space. You don't have to say anything important about it. You don't understand. And then just to make them feel that it's part of their space. This is very important. I mean, I was shocked that in Italy, which is, as you all know, a country of great um, art historical relevance and presence of, of art. Um, I went to a school which is very, the, probably the most um, humanities oriented, mm -hmm. uh, and we only had two hours of art history per week mm -hmm. versus, mm -hmm. I don't know, eight hours of math and physics, which was not very much compared to our colleagues going to the scientific direction, which would have, I don't know, 15 hours or something. Mm -hmm. Uh, and then, of course, we had six <coughs> hours of Latin and six hours of Greek and six hours of Italian literature and all other things, which were great. But the art history, two hours per week, which is which is very surprising uh, in a public school and in a country where art has such a such a relevant form. However, one thing that I've seen emerge recently and of which I am quite excited um, <coughs> is this increasing. Uh, and it's not a new idea, of course, but ideas recur in history and sometimes they disappear and then they, they return. And is this increasing dialogue between the visual arts and especially when it comes to architecture and design. So, uh, of course, in the Renaissance uh, and also in the modern era with the Bauhaus, we have seen this great compenetration between uh, art and functional arts, so design, architecture and how this could be taught together and applied together and studied in a collegial form. Uh, what I've seen recently in an exceptional um, exhibition, which is the first 
Nigeria Biennale that they held in Jeddah this January, uh, there was really an incredible focus on architecture. It, it was an art Biennale, it was not an architecture Biennale, but uh, there was a very clear architect architectural thread going through the entire display because, first of all, there were pure architects and designers invited as well, but even the artists would all have either an architectural background in terms of their studies or in terms of their practice or even just in terms of their interest. Mm -hmm. the, you would just talking to them, you would know that that's where their practice comes from. And this created such a powerful uh, dialogue and display and also ideas that really go beyond the object. Of course, as art historians and, and scholars and curators, we love the object per se and expertise. And you know, your brother-in-law, who's a great friend, is, a, is a, um, working down, down the road at Luxembourg and Co. He's a, PhD scholar on very specific objects and you know when you get to that level mm -hmm. of academic study of course it's amazing how much you can get out of studying the art objects which is what in a way also <coughs> makes them different from any other kind of artifact uh, or craft product etc but also seeing art as a broader discipline and something that can have a more sort of a, an impact that goes way beyond object itself because it intersects with disciplines such as architecture and design and I would like to explore this more with you being a, also a practicing architect how this is really the discipline that can have a political impact and a social impact in for example redesigning urban structures which is such an important topic today uh, this was really uplifting it, it was really one of the best and, and in fact it's been a sort of running not really a joke, but a, a running sentiment, even within the art community, that we almost prefer the architecture biennale in Venice to the art biennale, because in the art biennale, you would get some stunning things, and two or three things that you would certainly like bring with you for the rest of your life, potentially. But it's also extremely variable. Whereas the art, the architecture biennale, everyone, produces such incredible, mostly, body of work, which is so well researched, so well produced, because you can see there is a, a great deal of academic research, and it's, it's um, much less, in a way, to do with emotions and, and immediate visual impact, but a lot more with research and data nowadays, and also the use of new instruments like AI, uh, and so it's really impressive. Of course, you would need a month, you know, to get an even like slight idea of what's happening, because every pavilion would require a day of just being in there. Whereas in art, more or less, you can walk through you know, fifteen minutes most of the pavilions, and you can have a good idea. Architecture is very different, uh, but it's really engaging, and I think it's gaining a lot of traction. And in fact, the art world is now putting up uh, collateral exhibitions and events for art. <coughs> as important as the one they do during the art biennale, during the architecture biennale, because they understand there is like really a great pull there. It's very interesting. Uh, I might think that it's connected to different trends that I recognize. Uh, I think the first trend I'm thinking about, uh, for example, the castle biennale this year. The documenta. The, 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 yeah. the quinquennial. Yeah. And, and, and you can see that art is more and more uh, artists are more engaged with socially engaged uh, practices and uh, with uh, different ways to work together, not to work as an individual, but as a part of a group and uh, to co-design, to co-create with other people, to be part of the co cooperative, different cooperative. And I think this is what uh, maybe uh, they took from architecture and design, because uh, uh, you can't build even uh, just to uh, redesign this room, you need to have a team. It's, it, it's nothing that you are doing by yourself. Uh, th there was a kind of uh, a, a period of artist stars, so we, we knew the big names, but actually they were part of big teams. They, they never did it alone. 
And I think uh, this is something very crucial for architects and, and I think also for designers. And, uh, yeah. and I think that artist is uh, maybe getting close to this notion. W what does it mean to work with other and to be socially engaged? Uh, and, and I think also, if you're looking at uh, what is going on uh, in the academies today, especially in, uh, in UK, uh, uh, with the, the research or the, the, the new PhD in the practice-led uh, uh, research uh, for artists. And uh, I think it's very interesting what is going on, because it started with something that uh, for example, in Bezalel, we are still uh, discussing with the art, fine arts department, why do we need to research? In Israel, you don't gain uh, any budget for that. So they ask us, why? We are doing what we are doing. Why, why to, to engage with research? But, but when you are looking at the, the processes, it's, it's highly important and very interesting to see these processes, and I think it's part of what you, what you used to uh, see at the architecture biennale, and now you, you can see in the galleries, and, uh, and, and it's a very interesting trend, and I don't know how, where it will lead us, but uh, I see that uh, it's becoming more and more uh, sophisticated in a way. Yeah, I, I, I completely agree. I mean, uh, of course, Documenta was a, a, an example of that because of the collective nature of both Razor side and the artist side, but we have seen this happening uh, here with the Turner Prize, which is a science mm -hmm. collective, yeah. uh, recently, and um, and in other instances where definitely you see this more this approach that is definitely taken from other disciplines like architecture, etc. But it's not again, it's not uh, new. Things used to happen in terms of a bottega mm -hmm. in the past. Uh, it used to happen in terms of movements and type groups like futurism. Um, and um, in general, these are not necessarily new ideas, but they th there is an ebb and flow in, yeah. in these modes of, of operations. And of course, you, you don't deny the individual genius, which is always something that you know can allow you to jump from here to here in a way that you know the leap the leap is, is frequently uh, due to like an intuition. But as we also grow in terms of population, like globally, in terms of communications abilities and, and so on, it is more and more likely that, first of all, more people would have the same leaps, the same intuitions at the same time. And then they can pool resources together. And now we are seeing <coughs> I mean, scientific papers, academic papers, now they're signed by tons of people. Mm -hmm. Patents that once were one guy, that guy has 300 patents. You know, now you would have pool of people that have one patent, and they are like 100 people having come up with this one great idea as a team. Um, and, and the same, I think we're seeing with, um, with the assignment of great prizes like the Nobel Prize or similar prizes um, in the scientific uh, areas. You, you no longer, you often don't get it to a single person anymore get into a team or to a duo or to three people, three, four people. Um, so I guess it is definitely, as you say, a tendency which, which is probably inevitable in terms of where we're going and, and probably for the good. I mean, I'm, I'm sure that um, it shouldn't, as long as it doesn't stop the, you know, that ability of the individual to have that level of idiosyncrasy that then makes you uh, yeah. go in a certain direction. It's a leap. But I think that maybe the, the new thing that I uh, would be very happy to hear what, what you are thinking about it is the non-object art. Uh -huh. That uh, in a way we can be artists uh, dealing only with the process, with the thinking. Yeah, there is no object and uh, there is nothing to do with, with beauty anymore, with aesthetic. Uh, so how do you feel about that? I mean, you touch uh, uh, really... Uh, uh, or there because um, well this is this was the subject of of you didn't know this but this was the subject of my um, philosophy dissertation it was about the aesthetics of conceptual art which is de objectified um, and really my thesis was that eventually um, well to give a bit of context already uh, at the 
end of the 1950s, but mostly, let's say, at the beginning of the 60s, and then more prominently so, uh, in the late 1960s, artists have begun to experiment <coughs> with forms of art which were purely linguistic. So the idea was to explore art that was made purely of ideas, and ideas would be expressed through language. So effectively, these were artists uh, that took some of Duchamp's inheritance in terms of a primacy of the idea and of the philosophy over the object, but that did not necessarily crystallize into one object, even if it's an objet trouvé, even if it's something that we could all do or find or pick from the street and decontextualize and put in a different context that therefore makes it into an artwork. But don't even go to that stage. Go stay into the idealization stage, the project phase, where you think about, you write the description of one room, completely empty, with one air conditioner on one corner. And then you can make that room or even not make that room, but, mm -hmm. but that is the artwork. So this is what, um, again, a group, art and language, mm -hmm. British uh, group with American side also, uh, worked on starting in the, in the late 1960s. And Saul Lewitt, the father, the, um, the American father of conceptualism coming from the minimalist experience of reducing art to minimal forms, uh, geometrically speaking, and color, in terms of colors, and in terms of uh, materials also, out of that experience, he then extracted these statements on conceptual art and paragraphs on conceptual art that really, for the first time, um, conceptualized the idea of making art by projects and by statement without a need of. So what do I think about that? I think it is something that has a specific historical connotation. I think we have then uh, felt the need to return to the object and to feel, because at the end of the day, uh, art, the, the art object, the art work speaks for itself and is the independent of its creator in many ways. Uh, but it's, it's left an important lesson. And I also think that this whole idea of idealization and dematerialization, in the end, never really took place fully according to, to their plan. At least this is my thesis. But they have managed to contribute to our idea of aesthetics and to push the boundaries of what is considered art. Because at the end of the day, when you take a definition from a dictionary and you blow it up, which is what Joseph Kossuth did, uh, and you put it on a wall, that becomes an aesthetic object and it becomes a beautiful object. So at the end of the day, uh, they quote unquote failed in dematerializing art, but they absolutely succeeded in doing what artists do best, which is to reinvent the concept of beauty and expand the concept of beauty. So I think at the end of the day, when it comes to art, uh, that's what differentiates it from philosophy. They both operate at the highest realms in terms of theoretical uh, achievement and in terms of the, of the level, the, the, the depth and the height, which is the same thing uh, in Latin, it's the same word, uh, that you can achieve, but one as a material side. You cannot, uh, you cannot do without, and and that and that's and that's art. Mm -hmm. Then of course you can do one step further, which is when you add functionality. Then you go into the realm of design and architecture, and then you enter a whole other sphere because then you get political, mm -hmm. and then you get and then you know when you do a, a big um, building that changes the landscape of of a city, that changes the way that the traffic circulates and people interact and socialize, etc. then there you get into the political conversation. Art, per se, I think, can still be separate from that. And then, but it can become, through design and through art, then it can become a political, a political subject. Um, 
I think that you can be very political with changing the way people think. So if you change the concept or uh, you wider the boundaries, so they, it's, it's a political action. Yes, yes, yes. But maybe in, in architecture and design, uh, it much more affects uh, the body. You know, not just the way people think, but the way they behave. Uh, and I think that you can see the same uh, trends uh, in architecture and design uh, that become uh, less about the object. I think that most of our students are not um, so interested uh, anymore with, with the object itself, but uh, more with the process and uh, with complexity and how to work uh, with comple complex uh, systems. And you see designers dealing with uh, those questions right now, and they are doing it uh, as part of interdisciplinary teams. Because if you are coming back to the uh, big questions that we have, or the big challenges that we have as a society today, so in uh, Bessalel uh, we chose, for example, to deal with uh, four main subjects that we think that we can do <coughs> something to. Uh, so first is the, the climate crisis, and, and the other is healthcare, and especially healthcare for uh, uh, neglected communities. Uh, the third is education, that we talked a little bit about, but uh, we also think about uh, how you learn and teach uh, after COVID. I think it's, uh, for us it was very challenging to see uh, what we can do with hybrid learning when you have to work with glass, for example. How you teach glass? Uh, uh, during COVID, and uh, we learned a lot, and now we we studying it. Uh, and the fourth is the uh, urbanization. That that is, I think, that the main issue around the globe today. Today, and I think that what uh, uh, on the all all these questions you can solve as an architect or as a designer or as an artist, uh, but you also can't uh, really solve as a scientist. You have to work together because. Uh, uh, we see that uh, we bring to the table the, the user perspective and the human center and the processes. And uh, we are taking uh, some ideas which are sometimes very expensive, very uh, not usable for different people and try to see how we can work with that. Uh, for example, uh, we had uh, a big project with the University of Tokyo with the science uh, lab there uh, about uh, how you uh, can tell the health condition of a person through the capillary uh, underneath the nail. <coughs> so I don't know if you know, but uh, if you scan it today, uh, you can read the very delicate uh, changes in the health condition of a person. But the equipment for that, uh, even not all the hospitals still have has it today because it's highly expensive and you have to be uh, a specialist in order to read it. And we took uh, this knowledge and we tried to understand how to build uh, uh, equipment that it, you can use at home, which is very expensive, very friendly, that everybody can use uh, at, at his daily life. Uh, and then it connects to the hospitals, and you can read it there. So you can bring uh, like new no knowledge to people uh, which are uh, living far from uh, experts. Uh, for example, they use it in the neurology. So uh, this is kind of questions that we ask. Uh, and sometimes uh, I think that the scientists, uh, in a way, they uh, ask this question and then the, the designers come and reframe it to make it much more human-centered. And uh, Yeah, this is very interesting. It made me think actually of a program that I, I'm not sure, it's probably still running. I knew about it a few years ago. I haven't looked into it still, but I always thought it was extremely interesting and it was between uh, the most art-focused, the, the Royal College of Arts, mm -hmm. which is of course a, a well-known Art um, Academy and the Imperial College, which is a very science mm -hmm. focused, in fact, is, is a medical school uh, mostly, and then it expanded into various other areas, but that was the core of it. And they have this joint Masters in Innovation, mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and I don't know what else it was called, but essentially it uh, not only taught. 
talk to you about thinking of um, matters in a cross-disciplinary way, but it also has a huge deal of practice, and they, uh, they, they have you uh, design projects from start to end, and sometimes you, you would also, you know, for the projects that were more interesting, you would then get grants and scholarship and uh, studio space and office space, depending what kind of, of thing you were doing, but really they would follow through even for years after you taking the, and then they had an accelerator, so maybe it became a business and then they would finance your business. So it really was a, a process that took you from, from the learning phase all the way through launching uh, mm -hmm. a product or a business or, or a consultancy or whatever it might be, but that, that focused on this cross-disciplinary innovation. So I think, again, we come back to this uh, blurring of, um, of boundaries between disciplines, which, which is uh, definitely a uh, fundamental feature of today's way of, of studying and, and creating. And I think maybe this would be a good time to open the conversation to our to our audience and, and see uh, you know, if there are any contributions, questions, ideas that we can discuss together. Mm -hmm. I love what you said about what you're teaching the students. But how does that mix with their expectations of what they're going to be studying when they come in? And how do you convert them to take on this broader focus? Uh, I think that, in a way, we are trying to make a space for the, the movement of students through the years not just to, I, I believe that uh, you don't have to tell them what to study, but to see where uh, their passion is, and then what the questions they are asking, and through that, do this, uh, this very uh, unique way with them, through their process of becoming, but uh, not just becoming uh, individual, but becoming citizens, in a way. I think mm -hmm. that it's a kind of civic education. Uh, to study art and design. But I think that if you are coming uh, top down and tell somebody you have to study it, we see that it's not working anymore. Yeah. So I think that what we have uh, maybe is different from uh, philosophy or literature, uh, that uh, when you study art or design from your first day, you are doing something. You have to bring something to the class. And it asks you, wh what do you want to do? And then you are bringing it up, and then we are trying to open it to different questions, and they have uh, different courses, and they can study in different classes, but I think that the main thing is the studio, and what they ask themselves, and how we shape this question, and reframe it, and reframe it, and uh, bring new questions from that. Wonderful. Uh, you, may, you raised many, many topics, and very interesting, and very interesting ideas. And I noted from the beginning you were worried about the STEM problem in, in education, certainly in this country, where the focus is on what's practical, um, even you did say, you know, what's going to earn me a living when I come out, you know, which I find the alarming question of when people put that in the context of education, mm -hmm. because I'm a believer in first instance, vocational training is one thing, but education is another, and I firmly believe they should be seen as separate topics, um, otherwise there's no education and learning for its own sake. Um, but that to one side, um, art design and architecture are very accessible for most people. So politicians have less problems, I think, with <coughs> the aesthetics of maybe jewellery design, which is one area of your problem, and with architecture, where people actually all have to get to interact with the building or the jewellery, the object or whatever, and fine art. And I think fine art has a much bigger challenge to face. And when I look round the walls here at these really very interesting paintings, which I'm ill-equipped to interrogate and understand, I think I may have had the same problem with Duchamp, actually, although I'd like to think I immediately recognised the brilliance of the idea that he presented us. Uh, I'm not sure I would have. And I think that it, it seems to demand a level of understanding which is almost seen by some people, I'd like to exclude myself, I hope I can, but some people is elitist. So you have an elitist 
Klein Art over here, and a bunch of people over there going, oh, I don't really understand that, and some of them are politicians, and we know politicians and fine art don't tend to mix very well. Uh, um, how do you, I mean, to me, that's the topic that you probably need to address most urgently. Okay. I want to I answer. Oh, okay. I want to answer. Is it an added? Yeah, yeah, yeah. To, to answer in this one. <laughs> <I'd have to. laughs> okay. 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 Well, I mean, it, it is certainly, um, it is certainly a, a, a hot topic that has been hot for a hundred years, and that we we constantly face ourselves with. So, I'd say the issue probably is starts exactly when in the mid 1910s we start seeing this tendency of incorporating daily life into art and and blurring this uh, edge which once separated what was art and what was non-art, which was exactly the edge of the painting, mm -hmm. the edge of the body of the sculpture. Um, now, on the one hand, that opens up the opportunities for expression boundlessly. On the other hand, and this is the, the very first point I made, it, it lends itself to the risk of disappearance. So one great artist said, the reason why we call these contemporary tendencies conceptual art, pop art, minimal art, is because if you didn't add art to it, you wouldn't know it was art. <laughs> now, this is obviously a sardonic statement, which is, it, it takes things to um, a bit of a, an, it, it is a, an excessive statement, but in a way, it does make sense because that was also the objective in certain cases. You know, when Andy Warhol mm -hmm. um, reproduced the soap boxes, the Brillo boxes, in wood, in plywood, and you know, what he tried to do is to trick us into, is this art, is this, I'm at a supermarket, I'm not, that is a commentary on capitalism, on consumerism, but then at the expense of the object, perhaps, yes, no, but then what we have seen is that now Andy Warhol's Marilyn, which is a, a re-elaborated photo, effectively, it's a paint over of a photo, is the most expensive artwork by a modern or contemporary artist ever to appear in the open market um, just last year. And uh, you know, this was also something we discussed in uh, one of our talks here when, when we had our Andy Warhol uh, photo exhibition here. Um, so how do we, th the answer is to your question is how do we not make it into something that is elitist and difficult to access. Well, education is the response. What we are advocating uh, for here is that really, if you do study the history of art and the history of that brief period, those 20 years in which those great changes happened that brought by, by the avant-garde that really take from the tail end of Cezanne's career and continue into Picasso's great intuition of um, interpreting and subdividing space through cubism, and then uh, Duchamp's intervention, if you really follow that thread and see how those things came about and what they provoke, and the, the dialectic between constant pushes forward and return, and Rappel à l'ordre, return to order that we had in the 20s and in the 30s, and then figurative tendencies coming back, and then the influence of um, the, the fascist or communist regimes that they had on, on their own art movements within their respective countries, um, and all these back and forth in a way, until then we progressed on to a sort of less uh, dialectic and, and more unilateral or plurilateral directions starting from the 80s onwards, which is what we call postmodernism in a sense, uh, you can follow a story there and you can understand. And of course, if you are faced with something 
missing that whole bit, then it is difficult. And then that's why you need the art critics and the art curators and the art advisors to help you navigate this from a cultural, uh, educational, market perspective. But really, it's a matter of history. And no one is learning history today, which is what is alarming and is what we, if in those of you that have come here before that have read our journal or seen our talks or lectures, or we are constantly banging on about this in a very relentless way. You have to know the history. If you know the history, you can understand today. The problem is if you reduce, and this was our first point, which we haven't touched upon <laughs> today at all, but it was our first point in our preliminary discussions and emails that we've been exchanging in the past few days. Mm -hmm. um, in certain countries, and the UK, I'm afraid, is one of those, and of course the US to a certain extent, although the US is a more varied landscape, art has become this great financial instrument, mm. and it's been made into something that you dissect with this, uh, you know, securitization and you know shares of artworks, etc., which is an absolutely horrendous concept that reduces something that is meant to have a great deal of ideas and impact and behind it to a mere commodity. And then I tell these people, go buy gold, buy stocks, buy real estate, buy things that are to an extent, because also real estate, you need to live in it. So it's not, shouldn't also be a, a, a fully speculative asset, certain things. Um, go do that. It's a bigger market. It's a regulated market. Don't come mm -hmm. and create problems and, you know, we, we run an art advisory firm here. We work with the market. We work with all the bigger market players. We build corporate collections as well as <coughs> institutional and private collections, absolutely. But the vision in mind is always to create something that, whether it's for public, ideally, or even private enjoyment, but it still furthers the research of artists, the research of those galleries that do, you know, thinking and bringing, discovering, etc., etc. This is always the ethos behind what we do and what we bring our collectors to do. Uh, whether they are people, companies, or charities, or whatever else they may be. Uh, the moment you make it into a speculative trading asset, you completely lose that. And now, auction houses, galleries, etc., increasingly hire former bankers, former traders, people that not much to do with that, that have not studied art history, but they have connections, they have contacts, they have, and that's all that matters. And that's where things start to go very, very wrong because the people at the wheel don't really know how to drive, don't really know what the engine is made of. Mm. They just know that they need to be there and just accelerate mm. constantly. It did not end well, mm. for sure. Yeah, I, I'm hearing you and I'm thinking about, uh, I don't know if you know, but uh, Bezalel opened 10 years ago an ultra-orthodox branch for women, for women. So they are studying their art and the visual communication and the architecture. And uh, from what I know, it's the only place around the globe that has an ultra-orthodox ultra woman who, who wants to keep her boundaries in a way. You can study art. It's really very uh, noble in that sense. And uh, what is interesting that uh, now we have like, uh, we, we started 10 years ago, so we have uh, six uh, years of uh, graduates. Uh, that uh, and, and, and maybe to say that uh, this is a very international uh, program because this is the only program. So we have people from the UK, from uh, EU, from USA that come to study in Jerusalem. And uh, part of them uh, are, are staying in Jerusalem. And actually, there is uh, no, f no market for them and no field for them. So they are going out and they actually, they are now building the field. So part of them are becoming uh, part of the like common field, sometimes the international field, but uh, some of them are coming back to the community and trying to build the field where people can uh, uh, visit art uh, galleries, they open new galleries, the first gallery is for ultra-orthodox people in Jerusalem. And uh, it's very challenging because if we are talking about boundaries and our values of openness, here you have to have a kind <coughs> of membership of what, what you are doing with that. 
and they are dealing so well inside the community and it's very interesting and following that it's uh, I think that uh, they are doing great art very interesting and unique uh, one and uh, it's interesting to see uh, when the market the ultra orthodox market will start uh, with them uh, I think and what what, it, what would happen and maybe another remark that I, I when I uh, look at uh, the way that we are clashing in Bezalel with the government, it's uh, more in the uh, visual communication and design projects of our students, which is much more straightforward. You can understand it, you can yeah. be against. And the artists, they don't know what to do <laughs> with it. You can always uh, interpret it, so what, what, you, what you saw. And, uh, and for me, I'm uh, mainly urban planner. And, and I think that architects actually design the power relation in society. Mm -hmm. Even if you are looking at an apartment, you see the way that we mm -hmm. structure the power relation in the family, for example, or even is it for family, mm -hmm. uh, when who lives where. And but uh, when you are, uh, uh, work with the urban uh, context, uh, the government is, uh, is it's like uh, drawing the lines, and you as an architect just can work between the lines or to try to, to move them mm. and, uh, with the juridic juridical system. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and I think that uh, it's very interesting that I think that most of the uh, struggle are around the uh, architects, architecture, urban plan, and visual communication, which is, I think, very uh, affect in different ways the people. Is that because it's more um, uh, interrogatable? I mean, it's easier to actually say, I don't like that because it's a big building and it's not working the way I want to in my politics. Whereas with non-representational art, can it, is it revolutionary? Is it confronting my, I can see with Danica, I mean, there's a long noble history of art confronting politics. David and the Rafa Medusa and obviously Danica and, and yeah. you know, on and on. Um, Goya, the rest of it. But I'm just not sure that it's easy to understand something like that being provocative, mm -hmm. like Gunika. That's the power of it. it the least, you know, the, the least direct yeah. provocation, the most long-lasting it can be. <coughs> and I personally, it's always been uh, uh, something that I have uh, been saying and that the fact that the the more detached that art can be from the everyday mm. politics, the more powerful and probably long-lasting it is, I would, at least in the way it is expressed. And this is, not all artists um, agree to this, especially if those whose practice is very, quote-unquote, political, mm. but um, art can be political in very powerful ways, in ways that are a lot deeper than the news of the day. Uh, in the same way that literature is different from journalism. Mm -hmm. uh, and now, the majority of the books we see, which are New York <coughs> Times, bestseller, everything is a bestseller. Mm -hmm. And they're all journalist books. They, they're all articles, just mm -hmm. diluted to very long forms. There's very little literature. Mm -hmm. Literature has to do with form, in the same way that art has to do with form. It's not so much about the content. It's, it is content and form. And that's the, that's the key there. If it's all about the content, and you see quite a bit of art, for example, uh, in the Middle Eastern region, or in China at a certain time, etc., which was very overtly, very descriptively political. Mm -hmm. And that hasn't really had a long life. It, it, it passes, like the news. When something is more subtle, and it addresses things, but in a way that is not direct, in a way that is very Mm -hmm. uh, then that's where you have the longevity and also the power, the higher power. This is a longer and you know more extensive conversation to be had, but this is like <coughs> the, the, the main guidance. But I'm curious to hear. Okay. Um, hi. So uh, as an artist, I'm, a, I'm an academic. I, I live art, um, but I think it is my responsibility to the fact that I live art and I studied art history and I'm swimming in that pool, let's say, uh, it's my responsibility to simplify it for everybody. 
So I think it's also the artist uh, sort of responsibility or choice. Mm -hmm. If you want people in the art world to understand, only them understand art piece. Or to, so I'm, I'll give you a, an example. Like I'm working on <coughs> Israel right now as a project and I'm trying to make something decorative but also very deep. So my go-to guy, he's doing a postdoctorate in economics and I'm trying to explain my project without giving too much, um, you know, like a quilt from all over the art world. And if you don't know <coughs> all that info, you can't understand mm -hmm. my project. So I'm trying to like make it as simple as possible okay. for everybody. But I think it's each artist as his own. Like we see it as a field, but it's all individuals who give uh, critiques about the world that they live in from their perspective. So like you, you, we can't understand all art, but if you find you see myself you so connected to a piece of art, then maybe you find you're like go deeper in that, you know? I love it. I think that's absolutely. very simple. Um, absolutely, still in Israeli. Yeah, like, <laughs> straightforward. Okay. The question, and I feel there are maybe some artists, some more artists in the room, and you are an artist. We don't curator. Think, yeah, <laughs> curator. So probably um, also accessible. I really like how you talked about imagination and creativity, mm. and I think there's another side to art of it. And I think you you touched upon it with referring to documenta, and this is art not for art's sake, as it maybe has a historic problem. So using artistic creativity, imagination to maybe develop different models, and I think this is what Ron Gruber set out to be, offering an alternative of doing, doing things collectively. So I was wondering how like you two and also maybe other artists in the room like think about this, like art as kind of social engagement and art helping to like solve smaller, bigger problems, maybe developing alternatives to um, like the way we, we do things. Maybe it's an opening because I'm an architect, so it's easy for me to <laughs> be a decorator. Yeah, but I mean maybe for the artists in the audience to engage with this question. What do you think? I mean, I think that, that uh, uh, everything is socially engaged in a way, like has the capacity to be socially engaged. I think any type of practice. Um, but I think this idea like of history that you're talking about, that you keep on saying, I'm, I'm also wondering, and I, I'm going to like divert to that, but then I come back, then circle back to this this conversation about this like uh, process of social of being socially engaged, um, of um, this idea of history. And I'm wondering what history, like we're talking about, if we're talking about history that is sitting within the paradigm of art art context, or if it's a history that's stepping outside of it, that's beyond research, like lived experience. Which is, I think, something that we haven't discussed to form an artwork or to form, to form an artistic practice that is equally valuable, right? That also equally political <coughs> and direct. Uh, yeah, am I clear? <laughs> yeah, I mean, sort of. <laughs> I mean, I say that because I think we're talking about, I think it's in, we're talking about education, history. I, I think it's important to know and understand that. But our conversations here are kind of, you know, we are talking about Picasso. Picasso was mentioned as like, you know, like uh, cubist and spiritual. I mean, he's, you know, in his own experience, socially engaged experience, I think he's like kind of one of the biggest cultural appropriators of like, you know, of, mm. of, of that time, right? I mean, cubism is like, I get uh, a language that is like informed by tons of indigenous communities in, in, in different parts of the world, right? Particularly Latin America, what we know now as Latin America. 
So I think if we're going to talk about history and education, I think those things should be foundations in a, in a, in a dialogue about you know, how to contextualize, I guess, the, all, these, all these movements. That is, that is true. I mean, it always depends on the, which angle you're looking at it. So, you know, if, if the question is, like it was earlier, how do I interpret, how do I understand what I'm looking at? If I'm looking at a 1970s British abstractionist, mm. then the key would be to look at a certain history. But if you need to interpret other phenomena, of course, it would be looking at different histories. And this could this could be applied to a variety of things, and uh, when uh, you know, I think as um, far as your question is is concerned, I think there can be also two approaches. The artist can definitely be someone who gets involved in solving real life problems. And some artists are incredible at that, and that's where they sometimes um, uh, blurry. That the boundaries between architecture and design and visual arts, and they become, and I've seen it happen. I've seen artists put a sculpture in the middle of a place that would have become uh, uh, not a very safe or livable uh, area of a certain town, and that suddenly becoming, thanks to that, uh, the, the, the beating heart of, of the town and you know, a very safe and desirable space for new restaurants and nightlife and, and whatever else. So uh, this really can have a tremendous impact. And some artists are good at that and are you know, willing to engage in that. Others have absolutely no interest in taking part, and maybe they wouldn't even be good at it. And they just want to be in the studio, make their work, and put out the work, don't talk about the work, and then you can go and look at it, and your the impact that you will have from that work can then become indirectly something that can then have a social impact because you are an architect, because you are a politician, because you are a policy maker, because you are a professor, because you're an economist, because you're a lawyer. And you can then, through that experience, through that sublimation, through that elevation, transform whatever community you're acting in. And I think that's almost a purest form of what art can achieve. But you know, I am involved and I respect both uh, type of practices, but they, uh, they both exist and they can, you know, and, and they're absolutely both respectable. It's, it goes back to the conversation that we were having earlier about the object and the masterpiece and, this, and also the scholarship about the object. And the more engaged, blurred type of practice. So they exist, they coexist. Mm -hmm. And maybe to add that uh, I think that you can bring the imagination, the creative power uh, to everything that you are doing. For me, for example, for the last three years, I am the vice president, so my creative practice is management, actually. <laughs> and, uh, I try to think about what I'm doing in uh, the academy right now as a process of designing. And I'm trying, I, I think that the, the thing that I, I bring with me is the idea that anything can be thought differently. That, uh, and in the institution, you know mm -hmm. that you are doing something the same for many years, and it's very difficult. And I was very lucky to uh, get into this uh, job uh, in a space of transition, that we are moving to a new campus in the city. So it's a good uh, opportunity to bring everybody in and to collectively and to think together and to reimagine what it would be to be arts and, uh, and design academy today and what it would be to be art and academy design in an urban context, new urban context as part of uh, urban uh, uh, campus. And, uh, and I think that we made many decisions. Part of them were looking at the, uh, the ecosystem, the context. We are building uh, right now a uh, strategic planning with the municipality in order to change the city center uh, with the movement of Bezalel. Uh, but also we left uh, many spaces, I think, uh, academically, but also physically, without a program. So I think that one of the main uh, uh, 
think in the in Sala building, usually, I don't know if you know, but the, the, the new campus was designed by Sala. They are Japanese architects, the uh, Pritzker Prize winner, and, uh, and, and they have like two main ideas that I think we work very well with. One is the transparency, and we talk a lot about being socially engaged as part of the uh, OPS system and part of that. And the other thing is that they are living uh, in between spaces without programs. It's kind of topography that just moves through the building. Mm -hmm. So the, we have many spaces like that, <coughs> and we decided uh, not to decide and to leave it to the students and the faculty and the community to just to bring themselves in and maybe uh, in the in between uh, between the departments, between the disciplines, between the city and the academy. Uh, to create something new. And uh, I'm very excited. We are going to uh, bring all the students. Uh, the, the second phase of the movement would be at the end of this uh, month. And it will be full house right now. And uh, I'm very excited to see what would spaces would be. And, uh, and I think this is the way I think of what I'm doing every day. Like I, I'm, I'm still an architect, but I'm doing different mm -hmm. things. Uh, I, well, love, I'll, I'll try to add something. Um, as an artist, you are socializing. Like it's, I believe some of you have poems or, or drawings that you did in your life, but you might not call yourself an artist. Um, so like to call yourself an artist is some sort of make this step of saying something like, I have something to say, and I think people should see it. So you're socializing in a way with the world because it's not, you don't create just for yourself or for your family, you're reading a poem in the living room for your family. You're creating for other people to see and to have an opinion of your inner world. So you are socializing. As a, when you start calling yourself an artist, you make that leap of socializing with, your, with the world. So like every artist socializes in a way even if it's just his art, he's not speaking about it, but he is making an impact and an appearance. I have a question, sorry, do you agree that? I have a question about the, I, I, and earlier you said something about that for you, it's important to have a diverse student body. And I'm wondering what type of systems you are using. What when type I, of what? Systems. Oh, okay. Or processes you guys are using to do this to like outreach students mm -hmm. who may not uh, normally benefit from this type of education but also I mean because I imagine when you say diverse I also imagine maybe there is like space for to welcome like Palestinian students right mm -hmm. I mean, this is what I imagine so yeah. yeah what what are they like how are you reaching out to them how are you making them feel like this is something that they can do mm -hmm. or want to do how do you how are you engaging with them yeah. socially uh, so, in different ways. First, what I said before, that we are starting from uh, the high school system, and we are going to their uh, environments and trying to do something there. We are working with uh, uh, local galleries, like, uh, for example, we have a center in Umel Fachem, and we work uh, with, we, with uh, uh, we teach in, uh, in, in their own language, uh, during the high school, and then we, we teach Hebrew also, and we bring them to the academy. Uh, and we also uh, trying to, uh, in a way, to work with all the, all the students in order to uh, know how to, how, how to work together. Okay, because uh, if you are looking at, uh, I don't know how it is in the UK, but uh, in Israel, the different communities, uh, meeting for the first time in the higher education system because before that each uh, community the Arab, the Orthodox and the secular uh, has different system, educational system through the years. So it's the first time that they are meeting. And uh, with what with what we started our talk with talking about uh, pop, uh, uh, populistic government and populistic culture they are coming uh, not very open to the otherness and not very, uh, they, they didn't exercise what, what, what does it mean to be with some, somebody which is very different from you 
and has different opinions that someti sometimes you feel that it hurts you. And, uh, and if you're looking at what is going on in the university, you see that they are saying they are studying together, but they are staying in separate groups. And uh, what we are trying to do is to mix them from the first day. And just to, uh, I think that uh, the power that we have, that uh, they have to work on something together, they create something together. They are not just uh, sitting like this and hearing uh, a lecture. So th they engage with, with, with each other and we really work very close with our uh, faculty and the students in order to do it well. It's very challenging, especially in days like this, uh, and, uh, with the, in, in every conflict, political conflict that we have, we see it in the school, and we see that uh, they are staying friends and they create together with, with all the difficulties, and I think uh, <coughs> this is something. And also we are working very hard uh, uh, to, to let everybody in, even uh, if you can't pay, we are trying to, uh, to give scholarships and uh, to, to everybody that we can. It's very important to us that there would be nobody with a potential that will not uh, study, and you know that to study art and design it's very expensive, you have to buy the materials, it's not just to pay for the public institution. And uh, this is something that's very important to us, and uh, we have a very good team of students that work on that. Yeah, I'm sure it's messy. I mean, how does it make you like? I mean, I'm sure that you know we're living in a, in, in in a place at, like Israel, and even in the U.S. or in the U.K., um, which is you know, uh, I guess like uh, a culture climate that is like can be like horrifically you know uh, like racist. Um, what is that? What what does that social climate look like in those places? Because I'm sure that every, I mean I, I understand the way you're describing it because it's giving you a lot of hope, but also it's, it's messy where you're at, right? I mean we understand that, yeah. and I'm sure kids may not like it, and like the dialogue, the conversations they may have in there may not be linear, right? Like these classes are most of the time very non-linear. Like what are how, how like what what kind of conversations are happening? Like how are you? Like equipped for that, and then it's also is there a pipeline that um, like maybe aids these students into uh, once they leave this higher education into like the quote unquote real yeah. world. Uh, I will say it's not easy and it's not uh, uh, always successful. But mm -hmm. what we are trying to do is to open uh, spaces for. Uh, talking about their own experience and their own feelings and understand that everybody uh, is having fears or uh, having some uh, uh, different emotions about it. And it's not just uh, your opinion or what uh, you think politically, but what you actually feel yeah. in the class, in the, in the, to be on the street. Uh, and, and, and you don't know uh, the way that other people live before. So uh, we had uh, last year, we have uh, a very uh, uh, tense days in Bezalel. And uh, we saw that uh, the students in the School of Architecture, uh, they stopped uh, talk with each other. And uh, before they were friends and they were separated to two groups and they have a lot of uh, discussions. Uh, uh, at, the, at the yard, so I decided uh, to come as a vice president, and I just took each time uh, 20 students to sit together, and I told them, uh, you are here just to listen to each other. You are not uh, talking about what the other said before, but you are just listening, and you can say for three minutes what, what your, your feelings are. And it was like the first time that they heard, what, what does it mean to be a Palestinian? that has to come every day to the academy and to uh, pass the border. Mm. And, the, uh, and the Palestinians heard, what, what does it mean to be a soldier that just uh, came from the Palestinian uh, and has to sit with his own friends and has these experiences, different experiences. And I think this is the kind of work that we are trying to do, to, to, uh, to uh, maybe to remind ourselves that we are first uh, education part of the education system. And it's part of our job to let these spaces happen. And sometimes it can be successful and sometimes not. 
but not to give up to be optimistic about that. Well, that's great. Yeah. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. I think we probably um, exhausted the questions for now, but we are we can continue now over drinks. So thank you so much, everybody. Thank you.